Hi everyone, my name is Renee Long, one of the Social Media Specialists and Webinar Coordinators here at the American College of Healthcare Sciences, and joining me today behind the scenes for all our technical needs is Dominic Gaiello, the other Social Media Specialist and Webinar Coordinator here at ACHS, and today we'll be hosting a webinar from our Master Lecture Series. Each of these lectures features an expert in the holistic health field from the ACHS faculty. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Master Lecture webinar, Homeopathy Basics with Dr. Nolan Noska. Just a few items before we get started. You may have also noticed that your line has been muted. We are recording today's webinar and this helps ensure we can clearly hear our presenter. You'll also notice that you have a control panel at the right hand side of your screen. And if you have a question you would like me to write down for our Q&A at the end of the webinar, go ahead and type it into the questions box. Um, like I said, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions as we go, type them into the questions box at the bottom of your control panel. I will write them down and I'll read them to Dr. Noska at the end. If you have further questions that require a bit more research, please feel free to follow up with Dr. Noska directly at nolannoska at achs.edu and we'll post um, that email address a little bit later. Um, and he is happy to respond to all of your questions, but please just be sure to give him some a little bit of time to get back to you. And now I'll go ahead and turn the webinar over to Dr. Noska, who will give a brief introduction and then begin the lecture. Welcome, Dr. Noska. You should now have control of your of the webinar. Thank you, Renee. Uh, let me get this situated here. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. First, I'd like to thank Renee and thank uh, Dominic with ACHS for doing all the behind-the-scenes stuff to make this possible. Um, it, uh, it certainly wouldn't have happened without uh, their hard work, so I really want to appreciate them. And, um, and thanks to everyone who uh, decided to attend today. Of course, if there were no people to attend, um, then there'd be kind of no point of, do of doing the webinar as well. So thank you for all of you that showed up. And um, like she said, I'm happy to answer your questions. Um, in a timely fashion um, if they are more extensive than what we can cover in this webinar. Let's see here. Okay. So today we're going to be talking about um, some basics with homeopathy, um, but also um, the real application of using this medicine. Um, so I chose this, this name using energetic medicine in a toxic world, um, and, and we'll touch on it more later on today. Um, but it's a really important point. Um, I, I don't use that language flippantly. Um, we live in a toxic world, right? I'm sure many of you, um, depending on what uh, what place you are as students with um, ACHS, um, some knowledge of that or some understanding of that brought you to the more holistic fields of, of medicine. And um, it's no more evident than in the world of homeopathy because it is such a far cry from what um, we're used to seeing in the medical realm, right? Um, it's, it's about less and less, not more and more. Um, we live in a bigger, better, faster, more world and um, certainly American society uh, responds to that, but um, homeopathy lives in the realm of actually less is more and in fact so small that you can't even um, see it or um, detect it almost. It's, it's working on a level that um, is beyond, uh, beyond what we can measure um, with, our, with instrumentation that we currently have. Um, so it is one of the things that is so primarily uh, important for a toxic world because it's something that small can actually get to the place where it can uh, give the organism an advantage over all the toxicity that's coming uh, coming into it. Okay, so uh, some main topics that we're going to discuss here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about constitutional homeopathy versus, versus what I primarily use in my practice, which is um, drainage which is sort of a colloquial term. It's, it's actually biotherapeutic drainage, and I'll explain that when we get there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how these, uh, these types of remedies, these types of um, medicines work with other natural therapeutics. Um, maybe many of you listening uh, have a very nominal understanding of homeopathy, or maybe no understanding of homeopathy, but maybe you know herbs really well, or um, something in that realm or, or uh, 
flower essences or aromatherapy. And homeopathy is one of those things that falls right into that in, in line with those um, modalities. It's just another modality. It can work very well on its own. It can also work very well with other natural therapeutics, right? And then, of course, like I touched on, I'll keep coming back and back to um, where these modalities fit in our toxic world and why uh, why we may want to think about using them more um, simply because of where, uh, where where we're at in society. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, I am a naturopathic physician. Um, I got a degree from the National College of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. Um, there is extensive homeopathy training um, as a part of getting that degree. Uh, being a naturopathic physician does not make you a homeopath. They're not, um, uh, they're not the same thing, but homeopathy is one of the modalities that I had extensive training in um, as a component of my uh, medical degree. But it was mostly based in constitutional type um, homeopathy, or at least that's what I was, uh, that's what I studied, and that's what my board exams were um, centered around. Um, I did additional training as a student and in postgraduate years um, with a renowned naturopathic physician, uh, Dixon Tom, who is a uh, a very successful naturopath, but also a, a dentist, and um, he's been practicing for over 40 years. And uh, I worked with him in biotherapeutic drainage and using biotherapeutic drainage as a component of chronic disease management for patients. Um, the Dr. Tom is certainly one of the lineage holders um, for this medicine in. America and certainly America on the West Coast. Um, most of the work that he has brought here was an offshoot of the writings and teachings of uh, Gerard Gugnot, who is a uh, French, who was it, sorry, he, he's since passed. Um, he was a French MD who really um, took many of the things from biotherapeutic drainage and brought them into the real world. Um, it's an older medicine in the sense that it started in the early 1900s and he uh, sort of modernized it in a way um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s and um, Dr. Tom sort of took some of that and has carried it over um, in an American, uh, American sense. And there are other doctors of course, in America that use um, biotherapeutic drainage and are part of this sort of lineage piece um, beyond the works of Dr. Gunot. Um, so I'm going to talk about, um, you know, the basics from my education, uh, but I'm also going to add my own philosophy of treatment. Um, I think one of the things that is special about the holistic fields of medicine is that you can imbue you know, the, the practitioner can imbue their treatment with their own uh, philosophical notions and things. How, how I treat um, is different than how my, my cohorts treat, and that's okay, right? I can't treat every patient, and neither can they. So the patients that really need me find me, and, um, and, and that's, how we, that's how this whole thing keeps spinning around, right? Okay, so let's talk about constitutional first, and... Um, some of you, you know, maybe taking my homeopathy course right now, or you've taken a homeopathy course in the past, and um, there's a lot of confusion, right? So I, I want to clear a few things up and and straighten it out immediately. Um, strict or true constitutional homeopathy, from the sense of how um, Samuel Hahnemann uh, set things out to be, um, starting in the late 1700s has a very clear set of tenets, right? Um, things that define how you use the medicine to treat patients, right? Um, and these laws are, um, I mean, I guess I would say they're immutable, um, but the term homeopathy is thrown, thrown around a lot, and it doesn't always mean the same thing. So uh, sometimes people say homeopathy, and they may be referring to 
exactly what I'm pointing to here, constitutional homeopathy, or they may be referring to something completely different that's not that. Um, so constitutional homeopathy um, abides by these laws, and there are many doctors who uh, treat only through these laws, right? Only treat with uh, these laws in mind, and um, that's their guiding principle. Um, I would say that I'm not really one of those doctors, but I'm happy to discuss um, the merits of, of all ideas here. So let's look at these uh, laws a little bit more in depth and find what it is that they actually mean. Um, the first and probably in many ways the most important is the law of similars, um, which is better you know, boiled down to like cures like. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories about how Hahnemann used cinchona bark and, you know, treating malaria and all these sorts of things. And um, certainly that's true, but Hahnemann didn't invent that idea, right? Um, he, he discovered it um, on a more uh, foundational basis with the herbs and remedies and things he was using. But the idea of like cures like has been around for a very long time. Uh, in fact, the um, you know the the two countries currently that have the most homeopathic doctors per capita, I guess, are India and Brazil. And uh, long before Hahnemann ever discovered the law of similars for himself and for the medicine, um, you know, people in the country of India were using um, the idea of like cures like. Um, for lots of things, and it's often used um, in eclectic herbalism as well. Um, you know, the, the Native American Indians had um, herbs that did a very similar thing. So essentially what it means is that you're taking a small, small, small dose of the thing that has caused the condition, right? So um, you know, belladonna is a very uh, good example or easy example in this instance, and some of you may know this remedy. Um, it's a huge remedy in the Materia Medica for um, homeopathy. Um, if all of us, um, you know, were to sit down and chew a bunch of belladonna, um, we would be poisoning ourselves, and all of the uh, symptoms for someone who needs belladonna would be present in us from having taken a large dose of belladonna. Um, so symptoms like perhaps a high fever, um, perhaps a very flushed red face, um, a very acute, quick-acting uh, type of uh, symptomology. Uh, these would all be um, uh, symptoms that we would see, you know, uh, very um, uh, anything where the sympathetic nervous system is ramped up, ramped up very high, uh, so-called vagolytic symptoms. Um, that was that would be what we would see if we took belladonna um, at a very high dose. We see these symptoms in a patient, not someone who took belladonna, but we see these types of symptoms in a patient, say someone who's suffering from acute pharyngitis. We give them belladonna in homeopathic form, very very small. And it sort of resets the organism. It actually allows them to let go of all that symptomology. They're, they're no longer stagnant and st stuck uh, with that symptomology. Uh, so I hope that that clears up a little bit of law of similars. I'm sure uh, people have a lot more questions about that. And um, you know, if there's some afterwards, we'll talk about it. Um, it's the most confusing, but also the most important uh, law, if you will. The law of the single remedy. Um, you know, when, when Hahnemann first started, this was a, a more clear-cut thing, um, the idea of what does one at a time mean, how far apart does one at a time mean, does that mean one per day or one per hour, or what does that mean? Well, essentially what it means uh, from, for our purposes is uh, I see the patient, they come in to see me, and they need belladonna. They don't need any other remedies. I don't give them five remedies to take home and say, hey, take all five of these and see, hope that something happens, right? Um, I give them belladonna because that's the exact remedy that they need the most, right? That they're the most like. 
And so um, certainly later in his life, um, towards the, the end of his career as a physician, Hahnemann used, um, you know, you take one remedy in the morning and then a remedy in the afternoon and a remedy in the evening. Um, so this got a little bit more uh, loosey-goosey, if you will, as time went on and um, the idea of when that one at a time, where, where do we make that, that break um, is not as clear. But true constitutional homeopathy states that you give the one remedy, that's the remedy the patient needs, right? Maybe they come back a month later and they need a new remedy, but you gave them that one remedy to sort of shift them and move them to the next place they needed to go. Um, law of uh, infinitesimal dose, you, you have to use the smallest dose amount for cure, right? You don't give the patient um, a whole spoonful of it when a tiny little drop will do. Right? You give them the potency and the amount that's needed for them to achieve cure. Um, I'm not really going to go into uh, potencies in this talk. Um, it could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, there's, there's entire volumes written about the difference between potencies. And there's a lot of competing philosophies about um, you know, which potent potencies we should use and which we shouldn't and these types of things. So. Um, I don't want there to be too much confusion uh, other than to say that really what we should be doing as practitioners is giving our patients just what they need to get better, no more, no less. And, um, and that's kind of what that law means to me the most. Um, the final law, the law of direction of cure, and, you know, to be honest, I'm not totally sure. Um, I don't really think that Hahnemann... Hahnemann certainly abided by this law, but I'm not sure he actually wrote it down. He may have, but my, my history may be a little off there. But um, I typically refer to this law as Herring's Law. Um, Constantine Herring was another famous homeopath um, and uh, has done a lot of work and, uh, in, in the field. And this law is typically attributed him, to him. Um, certainly what it means is as the patient's curing from their symptomology, they're going to cure from superior to inferior, up to down. Um, they're going to cure from the inside to the out, right? So things are going to come from their digestive system out through their skin, right? Um, more important to less important. And in that sense, it means organ systems, right? So if the problem is in their brain, it's going to go from the brain to, you know, perhaps the, the stomach, right? Um, if it's in the it might move to, um, you know, the spleen or something like that, right? A more important organ to a less important. Um, certainly all the organs are important. I don't mean to, to uh, debase the stomach or uh, the spleen and say they're less important organs. I'm sure the stomach and spleen would be very uh, upset with me if that were the case. But um, meaning we can't really live without our brain having, you know, good blood flow and oxygen and glucose. Um, and you can't live without your liver, right? And the symptoms are going to go reverse order of appearance, right? So maybe the first symptom the patient experienced was, um, you know, some skin trouble, right? But five years down the line, now they have severe uh, gastrointestinal problems, and as they get cured, the, the GI problems will go away, and that skin stuff will return as they're curing. Um, and, and we do see that, you know, it's very common in things like asthma, um, eczema, uh, the sort of atopic triad for, for children. We see that, that reverse order quite frequently. And typically children are easier to treat anyway, and you see the symptoms more um, pronounced, and you see the changes more pronounced just simply because they have less junk in the way. Um, treating children and treating pets um, are often great ways to see homeopathy in action because as adults, you know, we have a lot of garbage, right? We got a lot of, of stuff in the way for us. We have a whole life's worth of um, emotional baggage and physical baggage and all these things. And sometimes it's hard to sort of poke through all that and get to uh, the thing that's most important, right? So in short, um, constitutional homeopathy is hard. 
right? That's the that's the the dirty truth and the most difficult thing to discuss about it is that it's very very difficult to become a skilled practitioner in. <coughs> Excuse me. It is very effective. Um, I've seen it and used it in action, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, and uh, it's amazing in its uh, you know effectiveness. But it's limited somehow, right? Uh, one way it's limited is that you uh, only get the one remedy. So what if you mess up, right? What if um, what if you are a good doc but you just you know you just choose the wrong one? I, I mean I, I don't want to make maybe darting playing dart not darting but playing darts is the best um, you know is the best. Uh, reference here, but you don't always hit a bullseye every time, right? Maybe you hit right around the bullseye or you hit a little further out. You still score points, right? But you didn't get exactly right on the nose. And that's the problem with one remedy at a time is that um, it leaves very little room for error, right? And, and to get to a place where you have little error as a practitioner takes years and years and years and years of practice, right? So that's, that's difficult. Um, you know, many many doctors that um, trained me when I was a student um, basically told me it's going to take you 10 to 15 years, which is a long time, right? Uh, it's a long time to be practicing, and it's a long time to make a bunch of mistakes um, with homeopathy. And um, you know, I don't know what sorts of um, you know practices any of the people listening plan on having, but um, you know, my patients are not going to stick around with me for 15 years while I make mistakes. They want to get better pretty quickly, and, and I want them to get better pretty quickly. So um, I'm trying to do whatever I can to help them get better fast, right? In the most, um, you know, uh, not necessarily fast, but the, the, the best speed at which they can effectively do it, right? Um, like anything else that's been written down, um, you know, religion would be a good example, or um, you know, even some uh, scientific thought. There's a there's tons of competing philosophies, right? Um, you're going to hear people who say, "No, Hahnemann said this, and he meant this," and the same person will take that same quote from Hahnemann and say, "No, he meant this by that that quote," right? Um, you know, things are translated and retranslated, and um, so that they're they're a lot of philosophies are born out of that sort of competition for what is right. <clears throat> but ultimately, um, you know, they're, they're, you have to find what's right for you as a practitioner, and that also takes practice, you know? So what defines as true constitutional homeopathy or what defines the true constitutional remedies? You're going to see tons of um, competing philosophies about that, so don't get confused. Just try to use them as a guide to find your way through the medicine. Um, I, you know, I, I say over 3,000 potential remedies. Well, that could mean 10,000 or 100,000. Um, it doesn't really matter. The point is there's lots of choices, right? So if a patient comes in, sits down across from you, you have an hour and a half visit with them, you ask them all these, these questions, they tell you all of these things, and you're narrowing down from you know 3,000 or 3,500 or whatever it is to try and get to one, that's a pretty tough job, right? That's a pretty tough thing to do because you have so many choices. So it can be very daunting as a practitioner. Well, maybe it's this one or this one. I don't know. Well, it's got to be one of these five, and I really want to know which one of the five it is, and you're trying to um, narrow it down. Well, there's lots of choice there, and there's lots of confusion, and that's another thing that makes constitutional homeopathy very difficult to be skilled at doing. So let's talk about um, a different philosophy um, that is in the homeopathic realm, right, but not necessarily, or, or certainly not considered constitutional. In fact, some people don't even consider it homeopathy, um, either to be disparaging of it or not. Um, it, it doesn't really matter what you call it. Um, it is a therapy, right? It's a form of a form of um, helping patients with energetic medicine. 
So biotherapeutic drainage or drainage um, began in the early 1900s. It sprung out of Belgium, and um, the doctors who put it together or started sort of combining these things, you know, really combined a lot of philo philosophies here. Um, they used the sort of Western, Western eclectic herbalism that they were well steeped in, um, being in Western Europe. Um, they used homeopathy, which pretty well um, because they, you know, were in Western Europe, and they also blended some Eastern modalities, um, some ideas from, uh, you know, Chinese medicine, um, even a little bit of Ayurvedic medicine, and these types of things. <coughs> Excuse me, which makes um, makes for an interesting sort of. Uh, philosophical soup, if you will, or melting pot kind of idea. So you have um, blended homeopathics in these uh, remedies, which consist of different herbs, different metals, different, different minerals, blended in specific recipes. And they have different um, you know, potencies in there, sometimes 6x or 12x or 10c. Um, the, the recipes were sort of devised um, as they were putting this together, which things worked best with each other. And they have specific recipes and specific dilutions. And these remedies focus on systems, right? They don't focus on symptoms. There's no uh, symptomatic approach. You don't say, well, my patient has headaches, so you give them the remedy that's for headaches. It doesn't work like that. Um, you take a step back from the patient, you look at them holistically, and you say, what is out of balance here? And then you try to treat that imbalance, right? So the homeopathics are given to try and bring balance back to the organism. And in doing so, you really, um, you know, help con the, the symptoms go away, right? You're looking at the systems, you bring the systems into balance, and the symptoms aren't there anymore because now you have balance. And the thing that was causing this, the symptoms are no longer present, right? One good thing about it and one difference is, um, at least with the type of uh, drainage therapy that I use, um, there's only 76 remedies, right? So you only have 76 to choose from. So instead of 3,000 or 3,500 or 10,000 or 100,000, whatever it may be with constitutional homeopathy, you've got 76, which still is kind of daunting, right? You've got to know those 76 remedies pretty well, but um, it's a lot better than 3,000, right? It's a, it's a little bit easier. Um, of course, with those 76, you can still make almost infinite combinations. So you can really treat anything um, and help with anything. So um, I, I, I want to be clear, I don't have any stake with um, Unda, Saroyal, or Genestra. It's not a company I own stock in. I don't get paid by them. Um, I'm not employed by them. Um, I use their products. Um, the, this is the company that I use. There are other companies that um, that make drainage therapies, um, but when I learn the drainage and in my practice of using drainage, uh, this is the system that I use. And often remedies are chosen in groups of three or groups of four. So I'm using those three or four remedies to um, dictate or tell me uh, what uh, systems need the most support with the body. Right, so that's what I'm uh, using those those uh, remedies to show. Um, often, this is biotherapeutic drainage is often called uh, using UNDA numbers. So you can see on there the UNDA company. Um, that's the company in Belgium that um, you know was created to create all of these drainage therapies. So um, sometimes we just collectively call them. Unda numbers because instead of giving the remedies a name like belladonna or causticum or whatever remedy um, constitutional remedies you may know uh, the specific blends that they made they just just call them by number not very creative but it's how they did it right so those numbers have stuck around and um, you use the numbers 
in groups of three or groups of four, um, and they spoke they focus on the specific body systems. Um, so again, Unda is owned by Unda Saroyal Genestra, which is a company um, that uh, bought Unda and now owns them and distributes them worldwide. Um, we're going to look at a couple diagrams, um, and I think some of this will make a little bit more sense to you um, when we look at the organ systems. But um, again, I just want to be clear. Uh, I use this specific system because this is this is how I was trained, and this is what I've what I've uh, gravitated towards working with my patients because it works the best for me. Okay. So if you look here, um, this is a uh, a body system. I'll go back one page really quickly. So we've looked at the diagram. Let's go back one page. Um, a lot of what the diagram is based on is from Anthroposophy, which is a um, you know medical philosophical system um, really brought into vogue by Dr. Rudolf Steiner. And um, so some of his Anthroposophy some of his thought about how the body develops is also imbued into how the drainage therapies are used. Um, so you can see the ages um, based around what organ systems and how they're developing. And the ages are basically saying, oh, this is how inner this is when energetically this organ system is developing, right? So it's when the energy of the body is focusing most of its energy on making this happen, right? So, for instance, if a trauma takes place at age five, right, well, it may affect the GI system because that's the time when it's developing, but it may also affect the lung, the cardiovascular, the endocrine, the nervous system. It may affect every, every system that is developing after that time, right? So, a lot of a lot of times with patients, I end up going backwards, right? We, we start taking care of, of balancing systems where they're at today, right now, and then we walk backwards in time to get to a place where um, we can really look at these systems specifically and say, hey, that's where the, the real trauma or the real damage or the real um, instigating event took place, and now we can start working on that so the body can remold itself in this new this new light right so nothing to get super worked up about but um, it's a it's a way of looking at these body systems and how they're connected to each other right um, oftentimes I'll look at things across the the diagram so for instance nervous system and kidney have a, a correlation to each other one being the first one being the last system and sometimes things that affect the kidney also affect the the nervous system heavily, right? So I may be trying to treat the nervous system by using kidney stabilizing remedies, right? Um, again, I don't want to be too out of left field or confusing, but uh, it's one way to use this diagram to help support um, body systems by looking at a competing system and saying, oh, that's the thing that really needs the most support, okay? So pros and cons, I mean, I've, I've talked a little bit about the two. Um, from where I stand, you know, neither of these philosophies is better than the other, right? They're just different. Um, certainly, uh, my goal in te teaching students is to always help people find the thing that makes the most sense to them. Um, I have many colleagues who don't do, don't practice like me at all, but their patients still get help their patients still get cured, their patients still get wellness. So it doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. It means that um, there's a lot of ways that we can help patients get better. And you've got to find the philosophy and the treatment modalities that make the most sense to you. Um, so I use both of these um, in treating patients. Um, I definitely use a little bit of constitutional. I definitely use a lot of drainage. And uh, I feel like I need both of them because that's the philosophy that makes the most sense to me. Um, when a patient really needs a single remedy, I, I, I know they need that single remedy and I uh, give them the remedy. If I feel like they need more of the drainage therapies, then we go in that direction. 
Okay. So drainage and natural therapies together. Um, yeah, uh, uh, maybe um, kind of silly, but as I say in the first bullet there, in short, it's a good idea to use them together. Um, I use um, some nutraceuticals. I use herbal medicine. I use drainage therapies. I use cell salts. I use, you name it, right? I use whatever's at my disposal to help patients achieve wellness, right? Whatever the patient needs, that's what the most important piece is here, right? Not, I'm so married to my philosophy that I refuse to um, try anything different or do anything else for the patient. I just want to give patients um, constitutional homeopathy because that's how I do. I, I'm not really into dogmatic thought like that. So uh, I think it's a good idea to use all of these together in the way that feels most natural for you. Um, I think that one of the reasons that we need um, probably a combination of these things is we don't live in Hahnemann's time anymore, right? It's not the late 1700s. Um, the world is much more toxic, much more polluted, uh, much more damaged than it was, you know, really since uh, it's a stark difference today in 2014 than it was even in 1914, right? It's only only a hundred years and the world is a very, very different place with um, the amount of technology that has allowed us to, uh, you know, change our food supply so heavily and pollute the water so heavily and all these sorts of things. So, you know, Hahnemann was uh, really, um, he was very ahead of his time in saying that uh, there should be, you know, you should have clean air and you should have clean food and you should have water. Um, the idea of germ theory and, and those types of things, they did not exist in Hahnemann's time. He was one of the first physicians that suggested that people should wash their hands, um, which was really unheard of at that time. Bloodletting and um, other sorts of therapies, sort of brutal therapies were the, the name of the game in, in the medical field. And he was sort of a, a contrarian in saying, maybe, the, maybe we should think about this in a different way. Maybe we should look at this from a different point of view. And um, truly, we need those things even more today, right? We need the clean food and clean air and clean water. We need all of those things. Um, but I definitely use uh, all of these together. And if done correctly, they don't really interfere with the action of homeopathy or drainage remedies. Um, I definitely have people take them apart from each other. I don't have them all throw everything into a glass and drink it all. Um, but they don't compete um, for wellness. Um, in fact, they can really, really um, advocate for each other, if you will, in the body. Uh, sometimes it's good to throw the body a little bit off balance so it can bring itself back. Um, another diagram that's really important, I often show this to my patients. So one of the things that makes, um, and, and if you've had a class with me, I'm, sh I'm sure, uh, you're familiar with this term and we talk about it. One of the things that makes drainage therapy so powerful is the fact that they work on our amuncteries. And the amuncteries are what we see here, right? Our lungs, our kidney, our, our GI, um, our liver, our skin. Um, the amuncteries are the organs of elimination in the body, right? And we've got to, um, we've got to improve the ability of those uh, organs to let go of the toxicity that they accumulate on a daily basis, right? So you can see sort of the spigot on the lower left side of the bucket, right? We've got to open up that spigot and allow things to drain out, right? Or we've got to really work on making sure that not, you know, less toxic stuff is being shoved into the top of the bucket there, right? Otherwise, it's going to spill over. And when it spills over, that's when symptoms are present, right? That's when symptoms show up. When it's spilling over with toxicity, that's when the body can't handle it anymore. And now you have all these, these symptoms. And the symptoms may be as simple as, oh, I have some eczema, or it may be, oh, now I have seizures all the time, right? We don't know what those symptoms are going to be because it's very unpredictable once the bucket starts spilling over, right? We don't know which direction the toxicity is going to spill out of. So wound numbers and drainage therapies and homeopathy and herbs and aromatherapy, all these things are focused on 
trying to help the body get rid of these things better, but I haven't found anything that works as exquisitely well as drainage therapies um, and helping the amuncteries open up and drain, right? So um, this sort of diagram wasn't needed back in the late 1700s, right? You, it wasn't as toxic of a world. You could give someone a homeopathic remedy and they would respond pretty dramatically. Nowadays, people don't respond that way unless they're really, their body's really ready for it, at least not in my experience. Um, so again, like I said, um, I want to do two things when it comes to among trees. I want to improve the body's ability to get rid of toxicity, right? And I also want to eliminate the extra toxicity that they're, that's coming into the body. So we've got to talk about diet. We've got to talk about nutrition. We've got to talk about um, their water quality and the air quality and all these sorts of things, right? I want less toxicity coming in and more toxicity leaving. And uh, if we can do that, then I have found in a vast number of patients, symptoms just start going away. Um, so most natural therapeutics focus on improving a monkey function somehow on some level, where, whether it's metabolic or it's, um, you know, true physical, more organic um, changes. Uh, natural therapeutics tend to focus on this, right? So uh, my main focus is helping patients improve with uh, lungs, skin, GI, kidney, body systems with their daily activities. So part of my treatment plans involve some of these things, right? What we call the BTGs, and BTG stands for Basic Treatment Guidelines. Um, so everybody gets a basic treatment, right? And their basic treatment starts with things that I would give every single patient for the, the most part, regardless of what their condition is. <laughs> Deep breathing exercises and castor oil packs, which I'm not gonna go into, um, making sure they're drinking the right amount of water, they have a good diet, they're, they're taking a, um, the right amount of fish oil, a good dose of probiotics, you know, maybe some vitamins and minerals if they need that. Something they're doing on a daily basis to help improve um, the basic ability of these amunctories to function. In general, um, all of the drainage therapies improve some amunctory function. It's not true across the board of the 76 remedies, but most of them focus on the uh, detoxification of certain of the cells in whatever system that you're focused on, right? And these other, um, these other tactics help that too. Um, you know, a lot of people think, uh, oh, well, supplements are not bad for you. I'll just take as many as I want. Well, really, in, in my practice, I see patients take way too many supplements as well. And you take... 15 supplements a day, it's not that much different than taking, you know, eight, eight drugs a day. Um, the side effects may, may not be as bad, but it's just as clogging and toxic for your body. So I'm trying to get my patients to take less and less stuff, not more and more stuff. So um, I've touched on all these things a little bit, but to, to sort of bring it back home, um, we have a much more polluted world now. We have a much more toxic world and we need a more effective solution to um, help that less toxic, you know, let the person rise out of the toxicity a little bit more. Um, and so drainage is the thing that I've used to help patients get to that place. Um, we improve amuncteries function, we eliminate cellular waste, right? And once we do that, right, once we clear the cobwebs, I can see more of the true patient, right? I can see them for who they really are. I can see their constitution better. I can see how they respond to things better. I can see the true person. And when I can see the true person, homeopathy becomes a lot easier, right? I'm not chasing symptoms around a tree. Uh, I can look at them and I can talk to them and I can see how they respond and I can really see what remedy they are, right? I know they need Costicum, or I know they need silica because there's no more of this garbage in the way of seeing the true patient, right? So uh, we can get rid of all those sort of um, consequential pathological states and we can see what the true pathology, if any, exists underneath. And uh, that's why I feel like drainage is 
so much more functional in the toxic world that we live in. Um, so thinking that we don't have um, a polluted internal world because the external world is polluted is kind of silly. Um, we are breathing this air. We are drinking this water, right? We are um, in an environment where media and uh, consumption of media is rampant, right? So we have all of these things sort of spinning around us, and we've got to do something to protect the internal environment from the external world somehow, right? So many practitioners I know um, use other things besides drainage therapies to achieve this protection. Um, I know many very, very skilled herbalists that only use herbs, and um, they go about um, achieving this end in by using herbal medicine, right? Um, some people use combination homeopathics. Some people use, um, you know, cell salts, for instance. Um, there's many, many uh, roads to Rome here. So uh, I, I don't mean to imply that the way I do it is better than anybody else. Um, but nothing I have used in my practice helps. Do I see such an improvement in a monkey function in patients other than drainage therapies? It's the thing that I've seen be the most effective, but um, that's you know that's just me. So I think that we can use homeopathy if we can find a way to find the true patient, right? I think we can use homeopathy very effectively if we can get rid of this toxicity, and that's the that tends to be the thing that's sort of in the way, right? It's the it's the barrier to good health. Okay, so I am. Uh, at the point where I think it's probably a good idea to um, leave the floor open for some questions. Um, I know I talked about a lot of information today, and I don't um, I don't want anyone to feel like I, I went through things super super fast. Um, but um, it, it you know this this could probably be 50 webinars. We could do a, a an hour long webinar. Um, every week on all of these topics and still would have more to cover. So um, we're trying to uh, pack things into a, a shorter space, and I wanted to give a good overview of how I see patient care and how homeopathy, you know, where the rubber meets the road, really, uh, where homeopathy fits in in uh, a, a true holistic practice. Um, so thank you, and uh, I guess uh, Renee. Um, give out some questions now, or we'll we'll get those answered for you. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Nasia. That was extremely interesting and very very thorough. So, um, hello. Uh, hi. Sorry. Are you able to hear me at all? I. You were cutting out there for a second, but now I can hear you. Oh, okay. So just a. Uh, pop back in if I'm having any uh, audio difficulties. I was getting the signal from Dominic that um, <laughs> that he couldn't hear me. So Yeah, yeah, um, okay. Perfect, okay. Um, so we do have quite a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. This was actually emailed in right before the webinar. Um, so this question comes from Jacqueline, and she would like to know, I wonder if doc Dr. Noska would recommend any books in particular if we wanted to learn more about home homeopathy, I would also appreciate recommendations on two, on one or two books on Chinese medicine. Um, okay, yeah, I can, I can help you there. Um, I think there's an excellent book um, that's sort of a, a primer on um, what homeopathy is about, and, and I don't know all the author's names, but I do know the names of the books. Um, uh, the homeopathy text I would recommend is called Flat Earth Medicine. And um, I can't remember the author's name, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, it's a very short book, a really quick read, and um, he talks about using homeopathy and sort of what the the basics of homeopathy are. I really like that book. Um, you know, homeopathy texts are difficult. Um, certainly, the Organon, uh, O R G A N O N, which is sort of the Bible of homeopathy, was written by Hahnemann. But it's kind of like reading a uh, manual for putting a stereo together. It's it's very dry, um, and it's hard to make heads or tails of. So, um, 
it, it is the definitive text, but it's also going to be very difficult to read. Um, but I think there's um, Materia Medica out there. Um, Fatak, P-H-A-T-A-K, has a Materia Medica. Um, Constantine Herring, who I referenced in the, the talk, he has a number of texts. You go and you, you start looking at um, some of the older docs that practice homeopathy. There's a lot of texts out there. You just have to sort of look for it. Um, and uh, as far as uh, Chinese medicine is concerned, I think um, there's probably no easier to comprehend text than a book called The Web That Has No Weaver. Um, and uh, I, I don't remember the name of that author either. Um, it's a little bit thicker of a book, but it's very easy to read, and he really makes a lot of sense of Chinese medicine. Um, I think it's a great first step, you know, first foray into Chinese medical thought. Absolutely. Wonderful. Those are some um, wonderful suggestions. Thank you. Uh -huh. um, so our next question uh, comes from Elizabeth, and she would like to know, what are the differences between the different types of dilutions? For example, 1M, 1X, 1C doses. Yeah, so the, the um, like I pointed out in the, the talk, I wasn't going to go into much homeopathy potency um, ideas because it's it can be a very uh, long topic. But essentially, the, uh, the letter designation is uh, Roman numerals for how many dilutions there have been. Uh, so for instance, if you have a mother tincture, which we would call sort of patient zero or the, the starting point, if you make... A, if you take um, one drop of that mother tincture and you add it to 99 drops of water, right, and you shake that up and you make a remedy and then you, you use that um, as a remedy basis, that would be a 1C remedy. It's, it's 1 one-hundredth of the original substance. Does that make sense? And then uh, 1X, X would be 10 right? Um, and then M is a uh, thousand, right? I, I can't remember the, the Roman numerals as well. Um, but you make uh, remedies. So if you did that again, right, you took one drop of that 1C remedy that you made and you added it to 99 drops of water and succussed it and did all of the potentizing, you would then have a 2C remedy, right? So very commonly, um, Remedies are given in 6C, 12C, 30C, uh, 1M, 200C. So you can see how very, very small um, the dosing of homeopathy is in comparison to what we understand as medicine, like 100 milligrams of ibuprofen or something like that, right? Um, it can't even be measured in milligrams. It's so infinitesimal. Um, it's working on a different level. Great. Uh, thank you. That was a really good explanation. I know I'm I'm not super familiar with homeopathy, so it helps to, to have those dosages explained. Thanks. So thank you. Sure, sure. Um, okay. So Clayton would like to know, if is it possible if we could see those two diagrams one more time? Um, just have those flash up on the screen. Um, if, yeah, if I can go. I, know, I can't control. I don't know if I can control it. Oh, let me see. Um, yep. Okay, there's yep, the first there's one. one. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, I, these came from Dr. Tom's text, mm -hmm. uh, which is called Unda Numbers, An Energetic uh, Journey to Homeostasis and Wellness. And um, you can certainly purchase his book. Um, I think it's a great uh, initial primer on um, using drainage therapies. Um, it's a text I refer to frequently um, and probably will for the rest of my career. So it's... Uh, another good book that, I mean, it, it talks a little bit about traditional homeopathy, but it's more focused on drainage therapy. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it could be a little too in-depth for the, the novice, but um, I'm sure someone might want to jump out there and, and, uh, and, and take the plunge, if you will. So there's yeah. that one. And then, um, I, oh, sorry. And there's the, the, the bucket uh, the body bucket diagram as well. Wonderful. And also, Clayton, um, we will be sending out the slides as well, with, along with the video recording, so you'll be able to reference um, back to these as well. 
Um, right. So, so our next question comes from Linda, and she would like to know: Can you use the same methods for pets and animals? Um, can you use the same method as far as? I guess I need some more clarification there. Um, as far as using homeopathy with pets. Um, so Linda, if you're still if you're still listening, if you want to clarify, uh, do you specifically mean homeopathy or perhaps uh, drainage? therapies or if you wanted to um, specify which methods you're, you're um, asking about, that would be great. Um, I mean, I, I'll, so. I'll answer it based on the, sure. the thought process. Can you use homeopathy and drainage therapies with pets? And the answer is, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's actually a number of, um, you know, homeopathy for dogs and cats. I, I think that's actually mm -hmm. the name of a book um, uh, that I've, I've read in the past. I don't own one currently, but... Um, uh, at least I don't own a, a book on homeopathic remedies for dogs and cats, but um, mm -hmm. it's used frequently. Um, I use it with my own dog all the time. So, yeah. And if she wants more clarification... Wonderful. You know, Uh-oh. Oh, oh, oh. Can we still hear you, Dr. Dr. Nazca? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I think you cut out. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we lost you there for a second. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um... Yes, and Linda clarified, and she did say yes, homeopathy and drainage therapies. Um, and, so and the answer is pretty a pretty simple yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so Jacqueline also wants to know where did you learn how to use castor oil packs? Uh, where did I learn how to use castor oil packs? Uh, well, I, I I learned how to use them when I was in medical school. Um, I I guess that's the the short and sweet answer. Um, but, um, you know, in looking at how do we improve the functionality of the body, um, we've got to do something that is, you know, a, a lot of people equate health to um, walking up a staircase, right? You know, as you're, as you're walking, you're getting healthier and healthier, which is a pretty good analogy, but I, I, I think it's a, a bit short-sighted. I really think health is more of like a downward escalator that you're walking up. And if you're not doing something actively to get healthier and to improve your health, you're actually going downward. And so um, I like to think of these things that I tell patients to do um, as part of that, part of their ability to be walking up the escalator more effectively. And, and castor oil packs are certainly one of those things. But, yeah, I mean, I, there was a discussion of castor oil packs um, many, many times while I was in medical school. Wonderful. Um, okay, so I think we have time for about one more question. But if we didn't get to your question today, everybody, um, feel free to follow up with Dr. Nasca, or you can follow up with us. And depending on if we receive a lot of questions, um, Dr. Nasca has expressed that he would do another Q&A session, another uh, live teleseminar if, if we have a lot of um, more questions. So just uh, let us know if you have any interest in that, and we'd be happy to um, set that up. So our last question comes from Heather, and she would like to know, essential oils cancel out homeopathic remedies but not drainage remedies. How would you dose essential oils in homeopathics and drainage? Well, that's a great question, and um, I, I don't. I think having a blanket statement that essential oils cancel out homeopathic remedies is is probably untrue or um, only partially true. In the sense that um, if you take them together at the same time, it's probably not a good idea um, because you don't want to have all those competing things sort of inside the mouth or on the body in the same place at the same time. Um, but if you separated them. Uh, in time, and, and, and by that I mean, you know, 20 minutes even, um, the likelihood of them having a competing activity in the body is is very nil. So uh, I, I don't think that essential oils um, completely cancel out homeopathics, um, but I do recommend that people take homeopathics and drainage therapies, and, you know, if it's something like an essential oil or even um, straight herbal medicine apart from each other. Um, I tend to recommend to my patients that if they're doing UNDA numbers or some type of drainage that they take them five to ten minutes away from everything else. 
right? And that may mean that they also need to take another thing five to ten minutes away from everything else. Uh, not to turn their whole morning into taking something and then waiting five minutes to take the next thing. That, that can be kind of annoying. But uh, you've got to set up a system where you're taking things apart from each other and still um, achieving the best goodness from each specific modality. So um, they are they can compete with each other, but I think if you do it in the right way, they don't compete with each other. Great, that's a uh, wonderful clarification. Um, so, like I said, everybody, if you if we didn't uh, get to your question, please feel free to email us or email Dr. Nasca, um, and we're going to put his um, email up there on the screen. Um, oh, I can I can move that to the last page there. Oh, okay. Oh, I think we. Uh, I think Dominic just put it up, so I think it's it's all good okay, up there. Um, and so thank you, everybody, for attending our webinar. And thank you so much, Dr. Noska. That was incredibly fascinating, and I feel like I've learned a lot. I wasn't um, very aware of drainage therapies at all, so thank you so much for that information. Oh, my pleasure. Um, so, and thank you everybody for attending, and if you just keep an eye on your email, you should be signed up to receive our future master lecture webinar invites, so we would love to be able to invite you to that, and you can keep an eye on our Facebook at facebook.com slash ACHSEDU, and our Twitter page at the handle at ACHSEDU. Um, and you can also go on our website at achs.edu um, to learn more about our Home, our certificate in homeopathic consulting program if you're truly interested in learning more about homeopathy and um, these type of therapies. So thank you so much everyone for attending and thanks again Dr. Noska and everyone have a wonderful Friday evening.